Okay. Good evening, everyone. Let's do that again. Good evening, everyone. All right. I'm Reverend Dan Smith. I'm the senior minister here at First Church in Cambridge Congregational, and it is a delight to welcome you all to this event. Uh, 10 million names, slavery and descendant communities of New England. Welcome if you are here in person. Welcome if you are joining us online. We think there are about three or 400 who are with us online. So glad you could make it. As we say here on Sunday mornings, welcome wherever you are on the journey of life or faith. I will let my colleagues introduce our esteemed panelists in a moment. But first, let me say what a gift it is for First Church to partner with 10 Million Names, the Longfellow House, and my dear friends, the Lloyd family, Dennis, and Egypt of the Slave Legacy History Coalition. As some of you know, First Church was founded in 1636, in fact, six months before Harvard. This is our sixth meeting house where you're sitting now. And many years ago, as we were preparing for our 375th anniversary, we discovered the names of 36 persons of uh, indigenous and African descent who were listed as having joined First Church, and yet their names were connected with their enslavers who were also members of First Church. We have been reckoning with this living legacy ever since and are grateful for partners in this necessary and forever work of truth-telling and repair. As part of uh, this invitation, I would, I would invite you to pause on your way out, first of all, and take a moment and notice the 36 names on the triptych if you didn't see them already. And I would also like to point out this fabric art project um, behind you here that has, um, it's called Wade in the Water, honoring and remembering enslaved persons at First Church in Cambridge. We began this project um, about a year ago, and I'm so grateful to Egypt Lloyd and Paula Paris and Sarah Fujiwara and Gail Willett and others uh, who have helped us uh, with this design. That's the Charles River. And you'll notice a few panels on there. Those panels have the names of Cuba and Darby, vassal, ancestors of the Lloyd family, as well as Sicily and Venus. And we hope to expand the number of panels on there. If there's anybody here tonight who feels a particular tug or a call to participate in this project, we very much want it to be a community project, engaging descendants of enslaved and enslavers, benevolent and otherwise our ancestors here as we try to weave together and wade into these waters. Um, one final note, if you need a restroom, right through those doors over there. And finally, welcome again, not 36 names, but 10 million names, and I would now like to introduce Joyce Jones of the 10 Million Names Project. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us here at First Church Cambridge and at home. My name is Joyce Jones and I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships for 10 Million Names. As many of you are aware, this extraordinary and collaborative initiative aims to recover the names of the estimated 10 million men, women, and children of African descent who were enslaved in pre- and post-colonial America between the 1500s and 1865. 10 Million Names seeks to amplify the voices of people who have been telling their family stories for centuries, connect researchers and data partners with people seeking answers about their own family histories, and expand access to data, resources, and information about enslaved African Americans. Before we begin tonight's discussion, let's meet our panel. Dr. Kendra Field 
is the chief historian for 10 Million Names. She is an associate professor of history and director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts University. She's the author of Growing Up with the Country, Family, Race, and Nation After the Civil War. Her current book project, The Stories We Tell, is a history of African-American genealogy and storytelling from the Middle Passage to the present. As a public historian, Dr. Field co-founded the African American Trail Project and the Dubois Forum, a retreat for writers, scholars, and artists of color, served as a project historian for the Dubois Freedom Center, and co-curated We Who Believe in Freedom, Black Feminist DC, the inaugural ex exhibition of the National Women's History Museum. Dr. Vincent Brown is the chief historian, I'm sorry, serves on the 10 Million Names Scholars Council and is the Charles Warren Professor of, Af of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He teaches courses in Atlantic history, African diaspora studies, and the history of slavery in the Americas. He is the author of two award-winning books, The Reaper's Garden, Death and Power in the World of Atlantic, Atlantic Slavery, and Tacky's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war. In addition, he is the producer of Herskovitz, sorry, if I mispronounce that, at the, at the Heart of Blackness, an audiovisual documentary broadcast on the PBS series Independent Lens, as well as the short video series The Bigger Picture for PBS Digital Studios. Dr. Kerry Greenidge is also a member of the 10 Million Names Scholars Council and is a Mellon Associate Professor in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University. She teaches courses on Black and Native New England, Black Boston, and the history of slavery, Reconstruction, and their aftermaths in the United States. At Tufts University, she co-directs the African American Trail Project with Dr. Field. Green, she is also the author of the award-winning Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter, and, and the recently released critically acclaimed National Book Award nominee, The Grimke's The Legacy of Slavery in an American Family. Joining our scholars tonight are Dennis Lloyd and Egypt Lloyd, the co-founders of the Slave Legacy History Coalition, a 10 million names collaborator. Dennis was born in Roxbury, Massachusetts. He attended Boston, Univer Boston State College and earned a, a master's degree from Howard University from the School of Architecture and Planning. As a Vietnam veteran, he served with the 52nd Combat Aviation Battalion in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive and was awarded the Army Aircraft Crewman's Wings for flying over 100 combat hours as an aerial assault door gunner. He has worked for the Boston Redevelopment Authority, the Boston Globe, and as a property developer in Massachusetts. Egypt has served as a project advisor for History Cambridge on the Tory Rose Hidden Black History Project. In 2022, she was honored to be invited by Harvard University to serve as the panelist at the University of Virginia's Legacies of Slavery Conference. In addition to her work in history, Egypt is a certified commercial pilot accredited by the Federal Aviation Administration. She is currently pursuing a, de a degree in aeronautics and aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddle Aer Aeronautical University. The Slave Legacy History Coalition is a consortium of individuals, organizations, and institutions engaged in the preservation of the history of enslaved people in the Cambridge and Boston communities and beyond. It was established in the fall of 2021 by the Lloyd family descendants of Tony Cuba and Darby. 
Interestingly, Darby is buried just five doors down the road at Christ Church in the crypt of the vassal and royal families that enslaved his family. The Slave Legacy History Coalition aims to build a pathway forward for other families who are descendants of slaves and also the general public to help connect to the vast repositories of information on slave legacy history in the Boston and Cambridge communities and beyond. I first met the Lloyds last year when I wrote about their ancestor, Darby Vassal, for Harvard's Legacy of Slavery Initiative. Most recently, I wrote about the extraordinary bond they have formed with Julia Royal, a collateral descendant of Isaac Royal Jr. for the new and upcoming 10 Million Names quarterly newsletter. These two families are shining and powerful examples of what can happen when people cast their misgivings and misperceptions aside to help draw a more accurate picture of our nation's history. Ten, ten million names is honored to call them our partners. Now, before we hear from our scholars, Dennis will provide an overview of the coalition. Thank you very much, Joyce. Good evening, everyone, and very glad. Okay. That's even better. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you, Dan, for the church. And it's wonderful to sit here with all of these distinguished scholars. And I just wanted to take a moment. Joyce did touch on a number of uh, uh, points that uh, uh, helped establish the Slave Legacy History Coalition. But let me just say that in 2020, uh, we were contacted by a student uh, from Harvard, uh, undergraduate student by the name of Carissa Chin, who uh, contacted uh, my youngest daughter, Jordan, and informed her that there might be a link between you know, the uh, information uh, that she had found on uh, Tony and Cuba and, and our family. Uh, fortunately, we had information which corroborated with what uh, uh, she had. And, uh, once we were able to put together the links of the family history that we had, um, hence we moved forward to uh, do some research. One of the interesting points that we found out in this small community of Cambridge and Boston is that there are a vast number of repositories where information had been contained on our family. So with that in mind, <laughs> we figured that we'd reach out and with the help of the Longfellow House, the National Park Service, uh, First Church in Cambridge with Dan Smith um, and other members, uh, Paula Parrish and, and uh, the Cambridge Black History Project, we were able to knit together an organization which uh, over the last couple of years has grown to include uh, a vast number of uh, institutions and individuals from not only this community from, uh, but also from beyond. Now, the Slave Legacy History Coalition is a platform. It's a platform. We're not here to redefine uh, history, build history, but we're a platform which allows other individuals who have a connection to slave history uh, legacy to tell their story. And fortunately tonight, we happen to have uh, Dr. Kerry Greenwich, who was our very first speaker in, uh, on January 12th, uh, 2021. So we're very pleased to be with her. And uh, she uh, delivered a uh, very interesting um, uh, presentation on William Monroe Trotter. So we're very thankful for, the, for her. Now, uh, as a platform, we have, uh, over the last, uh, I guess, 36 months, I guess, uh, we've had a number of speakers who have come forth, told their story, and uh, it's been very interesting from not only the standpoint of putting together an organization where stories can be delivered, but also from the point of view that so many individuals have been able to learn um, history that was hidden uh, from them. So tonight, we're very pleased to be here, not only with these distinguished individuals, but to be here in your presence to have this story told a little bit more. And the 10 million names is certainly a very uh, worthwhile project that all of us will gain information from. So I thank you all for being here. I thank Dan, uh, the Longfellow House, Chris, Emily, and certainly um, you know, all of you here. So thank you without further ado. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dennis and Egypt. I can't thank you enough. Thanks to the Slave Legacy History Coalition for all the work that you've been doing. Um, thank you to the Longfellow House, National Park Service, Emily Levine, uh, especially to Reverend Dan Smith, uh, Joyce Jones, uh, First Church, and, and, and my colleagues here. Um, you know, the work, uh, Dennis, that you're speaking of is is so close um, you know, to my own heart, and I think in many ways to the heart of the project that we're talking about here today. Um, whenever I talk about uh, 10 million names as an endeavor, um, I talk about it as you know, joining a tradition, right? Um, 10 million names is joining a long, long tradition of African American families and communities telling our own stories, oftentimes behind closed doors when no one else was listening or watching, um, and um, trying to knit together, um, as I said, um, uh, kindred efforts, right? And that's centuries long. Um, we know that stories about African American families, uh, family names, traditions, rituals, genealogies, themselves, birth dates were passed down even during the period of enslavement. From the Middle pas Passage onward, we have records, um, and that, that's, uh, that's what I'm involved in now. My, the, the book that I'm finishing now is that kind of longer history of what I sometimes call Roots Before Roots, or Roots Before Alex Haley, um, and including Alex Haley. <laughs> um, but, but what I wanted to say is that, you know, I, I'm a historian now, I'm a professional historian, but I became a historian because of my grandmother's stories and because of our family stories. And so I really um, you know, I heard her tell me stories as a child uh, about her grandparents, uh, their experiences in slavery and the immediate post-emancipation era um, in Mississippi and Indian Territory, Oklahoma, black towns of Oklahoma, really. And that's what I ended up, write, you know, writing my first book about. And so, because of that kind of somewhat unusual at the time path into the historical profession, um, what I care about most, uh, one of the things I care about most in the course of this kind of work is um, the relationship between history and memory between history and genealogy, um, that although, you know, in spite of the history of history, capital H, as something that was objective or, or far away from the person or from the life experience, in fact, you know, what I've learned all along, what I've learned, you know, as time has gone on is that, you know, from W.B. Du Bois to Carter Woodson uh, to Anna Julie Cooper, all these people we think of as leading black scholars in the early 20th century were, in fact, deeply engaged in their own family history work, in tracing their own genealogies, even when they weren't allowed to bring that to the fore. And so part of the spirit of 10 Million Names um, that I'm really excited about is bringing together both historians and genealogists, which historically has not happened as often as it really needs to happen. Um, many of us know from firsthand experience that that produces results we could never get otherwise, right? That historians and genealogists sometimes go to different places, use different tools, and the 10 Million Names Project, as it attempts to build this kind of database of the names of the 10 million people who were enslaved in what became the US, is really trying to um, make the best of, of, of both of those worlds, right? Um, go to old books, <laughs> out of print, old manuscript sources in archives, but also family histories, genealogies, family Bibles, right? And, and bring those um, often uh, disparate sets of sources together. So um, we have some, I think, some images. Yes. And we'll go to the next slide there. Um, so this is a picture of my uh, my grandmother as a child, the person I was just talking about, and um, and the people that I traced, her grandparents, in the course of that book. You can go to the next slide. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, um, as Joyce mentioned, the African American Trail Project was something that my colleague Dr. Greenwich and I started about seven years ago to try to map places. When we approach history, African American history, we often do so through people and through places. And so a lot of the places we started with right here in Boston uh, and Cambridge uh, were the ones that are now mapped on, onto this project. And we can go to the next slide. And in the course of doing that work, we had developed partners. And our very first partner in this work was the Royal House and Slave Quarters back in 2016, of course, not coincidentally, about four blocks from the campus of Tufts University. Um, and we were interested in, in figuring out how can the university 
be of service to local black-led uh, historical efforts and institutions. And so our partners at the time were the West Medford Community Center, the Royal House and Slave Quarters, um, the Robbins House out in Concord, the Museum of African American History in Boston, and eventually um, the Du Bois home site out in Western Massachusetts. And in the course um, of that work, of course, we came upon the history of um, the royal family, Belinda Sutton, um, people who were descended from the enslaved um, individuals at the Royal Enslaved Quarters and who, who married later into the Basil family, which leads us here tonight. Go to the next slide. Um, and so I'm just going to say a few words about 10 million names, and then I'm going to ask um, my colleagues a few questions um, about what brings them to this work. So 10 Million Names aims, as I said, to document uh, those 10 million women, men, and children of African descent who were enslaved on what became the United States. Um, those 10 million have approximately 44 million descendants today, all of us of whom encounter greater difficulty than do most others in tracing our ancestors. Um, in the genealogy community, they, also, they often refer to something called the 1870 brick wall, um, which refers to the fact that you know, before 1870, you don't have a systematic federal census that documents people of African descent. Um, that unevenness that's driven there, that inequality is itself a direct legacy of American slavery. So we can talk about kind of the inequalities within family history, within genealogy that are created by the nature of the history itself and the resulting archive. Um, so the ultimate goal of this project is to create a permanent free and public database that's accessible to all. We can go to the next slide. And to the next slide. Um, and to the next one. So that's that brick wall in genealogical research um, post-emancipation. Having said that, there, as historians and genealogists and descendants know, there are many, many places we can go to look for those names prior to 1870, especially in New England, but not exclusively in New England. People wrote down a lot up here. Um, we can go to the next slide. And, um, and we're trying to address and redress the fact that data was unrecorded or deliberately obscured and can be more challenging to recover. Next slide. So I'll say I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A. I think that Joyce covered the, a bit about American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society, which is the kind of parent organization um, that initiated 10 million names. Um, it's, the world's, it's, it's the oldest genealogical society in the US and it's been around since 1854. And we can go to the next slide. And the project involves, as I said, both historians and genealogists, but also descendant communities, family historians, cultural institutions, universities, and schools. Next slide. Um, the advisory board, of course, is um, graced with uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Gates, um, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, and, and Richard Cellini, among others. And the next one. There's a lot of collaborators I can talk about in the Q&A if we wish, um, but I think in the interest of time, we will continue forward. Next slide. Okay, so the goal is to establish a document-based research repository, and most importantly, to connect resources and people and amplify the voices of people who have been telling their stories for generations. Um, so um, where I began, you know, really, being a clearinghouse of sorts, a place where we can bring together many, many efforts. I mean, what was most um, incredible in the days after the launch of this project last summer are the kind of hundreds of emails that we received in those initial months, and they continue to trickle in every day from people who are, you know, in Kansas tending a local cemetery, um, trying to document the names of the people who were enslaved there and who were buried in that in, in that ground. Um, people who have been tracing their own genealogies, people who have been tracing um, that of a family they're connected to in some other way, um, people who have been tracing the enslaved people that were um, owned by their own ancestors, right? So all different ways that people have come to this project and responded to it in relationship to the history and legacies of the institution of slavery and the Atlantic slave trade. <laughs> The next one. Um, and I'm going to skip through the next five, Dan. Thank you so much. These, I'm happy to talk more afterwards about the different projects, um, the different kind of buckets of information that we're gathering to get to that 10 million, which obviously is an incredibly um, work-intensive um, effort. Next one. Great. And before I close and turn it over to the questions here, I just want to close with the concept of intergenerational identity. Um, you know, in my work, I often... Um, 
come across, I mean, what we know anecdotally, how powerful it is for children to know um, where we come from, like who our people are, how powerful that was for me um, growing up, and and how powerful it is for, for and can be for so many others. And psychologists have actually begun to study this. There are some um, you know, published uh, studies in the last 15 years about the importance of what they call intergenerational identity or children knowing that they belong to something bigger than themselves. Um, it's shown to have a direct impact on children's resilience um, and on their um, ability to respond to shifting circumstances in life. I think that has particular implications for African American families and communities, and that's a big part of this project. We can go to the next one. And the last one. Picture of my grandma and her siblings, and then there's after this, I think, a picture of a sack. Yes, so you might be familiar with this image. It's from uh, one of my mentors, Taya Miles' um, research on uh, Ashley's sack, the name of the book. And uh, when I encountered this object um, um, years ago now, um, it really spoke to the power of intergenerational identity and knowledge um, and the importance that it has for children caring for this over time. And it reads, my great grandmother, I'm going to be able to read it, my great grandmother Rosa, um, and I may not be able to read it from here, um, but was sold at age nine in South Carolina and gave me this bag which had um, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of roses, um, and told me it'd be filled with my, with her lo my love always. And then it signed Ruth Middleton. To think about three generations, an object being passed down. Very often, uh, the approach to kind of professional history uh, over the course of the first, you know, century of the profession, right, did not take into account these kinds of objects and stories that were told behind closed doors, and um, that is a fact that um, I spend most of my um, days and sometimes nights um, trying to think about and respond to, where that information traveled, um, how we held on to it even when no one else was watching, and I think it's, it's an important part, not the only part, but an important part of this project too. Okay, so I will end there, and I have questions for my colleagues, um, Dr. Vincent Brown and Dr. Carrie Gunnage. The first question is, what brings you to this project, personally? What was perhaps your first introduction to African American history or genealogy, and how has that shaped your research and career? And I will give it to Dr. Gunnage first. Oh, oh well, thank you. Is, can you hear me? My voice is very loud, so I apologize if it seems like I'm yelling. I tend to. <laughs> um, I was first fascinated by this project due to the type of history that I do, which is trying to tell the stories of black people in places where we often don't think that black people exist. And particularly the ways in which those communities that exist in places where we don't think black people exist, the sort of radical potential that that has on the politics of that community. And um, how that community relates to the politics and the culture of the African diaspora. Um, and so I really adore this project because it is using and tapping into genealogical tradition, particularly of communities um, that have been doing this, as, as Kendra said, for years and years and years. Um, I had the pleasure of talking to your group, uh, the, the Lloyds, and one of the things that I remember at that talk is the amount of um, response I got afterwards from people, it's like the middle of the pandemic, and people who were like, oh my goodness, you're talking about William Monroe Trotter. My family remembers Trotter from the 1920s, or my family remembers um, the uh, black um, people who lived in Central Square who were from the Caribbean who were involved in the National Equal Rights League. Um, and so the amount of people who really responded to the stories of um, uh, to, to biography and to um, the, the genealogical research that I relied a lot upon a lot for both of the books that I wrote, and that I see, you know, someone like a Kendra Field, something of like Vince Brown, really say, taking black people um, seriously on sort of what they're saying about their past and their communities. And so, really, I look at 10 million names as a vehicle for marrying together um, genealogists, communities who have functioned as genealogists in their communities for years and years, with historians and with something like American ancestors that can put kind of the resources behind creating this 
this database. And I always say, what would it mean that my nieces who are, um, two of them are in high school, one of them is four years old, that maybe 20 years from now, it would be easier for them to tap into their history of my father's family, who's from Barbados, and then moved to um, Central Square, Cambridge, and my mother's family, who has been in New England, you know, since at least the 1880s. Um, being able to have an easier time of just compiling those records, right? And what that means to people, as Kendra was saying. So I'm, I'm really attracted to this, to this project through that, and it informs all the scholarship that I do and the books that I, I write. And same question for you. Dr. Same Brown. question. Okay, can you all hear me? Uh, well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It's fantastic to be here. I'm really excited about this project, in part just because I love black history. And I love black history because I grew up in Southern California in the 1970s and 1980s. And our black history education in California public schools at the time was about what I think Ron DeSantis wants black history education to be in Florida right now. I learned very little about the history of slavery. I mean, we had on black history, you know, maybe a week on the Civil War, where we learned a little bit about slavery, and then a week on the Civil Rights Movement, Right? So it was mostly about like black people's role in enhancing the civility of American civilization. <laughs> right? Civility all the way down. We didn't really learn much about slavery at all in my schools. And when I first cottoned on to the idea that this was a big subject, a subject of endless fascination to me, was we had these like family chitlin nights in Southern California. Where my parents were from the South, they had black friends from the South, and so every Wednesday night, we would have these little gatherings of black people in Del Mar, California, um, where they would tell stories about the South, and they would tell these stories about their families. And so there was a kind of secret, furtive knowledge of black history, of family history, that was already something extending beyond what I was learning in school. And then I got to high school, and I became a fan of reggae music. You can probably tell. And I saw a group called Burning Spear. Any of you guys know Burning Spear? Winston Rodney Burning Spear? And he had this song called Slavery Days. And the chorus was, do you remember the days of slavery? And I said, no. <laughs> I go, no. But the question, right? Do you remember the days of slavery? And how would you remain? How would you remember the days of slavery? kind of became the question that would animate my work for the next 30, 40 years up until today. And the fact that this project is helping to answer that question, is helping to shape how we remember the days of slavery for not only our own families, but for families all across the country, and I hope extending beyond the United States is one of the things that attracts me to it most strongly. So I'm, I'm happy to be here because I feel like I'm right in line um, with the aims of the project. Thank you so much, um, both of you. So my next question is um, for Dr. Greenwich, uh, and then I have a different question for, for Dr. Brown. Uh, how do you think about the history of New England and Boston in particular when it comes to the broader context of black history and genealogy? Um, what makes this place tick? How does that shape how we do history or genealogy here differently? What makes Boston tick? I think we would all like the the. Ten steps ahead if we knew that, but anyway, I'm joking. But um, but <laughs> no, yes. Um, I think that um, the history of Boston and New England is a place where because people kept such intricate records, you know, those Puritans liked to write about themselves and the things that they were inflicting on the rest of the world in sort of minute detail. And so I think there's actually many more records than we would think of these communities and these people if we know to look. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that New England and Boston in particular is, I like to say, is much more of a microcosm of where kind of the African-American and African, Amer African diasporic people in the United States are currently. There is a report that came out by James Jennings, who's a colleague at Tufts University um, in 2020, that said Greater Boston has the highest percentage, so that's higher than New York City, higher than New Jersey, higher than Florida, of 
of, of people who define themselves as black who are foreign born. So that's one third. So if you take in Boston, Cambridge, all of the greater Boston, we count for. And that to me um, speaks to, yes, speaks to kind of the diasporic nature of how we should approach looking at black history and African American history, number one. Number two, I think that Boston and New England kind of allows us to have discussions and arguments surrounding slavery and their legacies that taps into the fact that this is an American and a global story as opposed to a story just of the American South, right? We like to think of, oh my goodness, the, the South is horrible, particularly in New England. Oh my goodness, they're horrible and we're the place of abolition and the place of anti-slavery and, you know, a few blocks away from here we have, you know, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who's writing eloquently about anti-slavery. Well, Longfellow's house was also owned, as we know, by the vassals who were slaveholders. And so I think Boston and New England are micro of how we approach these conversations because we tend to um, put it on the South, right? Whatever that is, whatever racial evils we think are occurring at the moment, right? And if we start to look at, you know, that it's a diasporic black community and that slavery is was a global system and an Atlantic system and a Pacific system, then we start to really get to the heart of what um, the legacies of enslavement look like. I would also say that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over, I would also say that, you know, I grew up in uh, this area. My father's family was from Barbados. They lived a few blocks away in Central Square. They have since been priced out there of they Central are Square. Now. Oh, they, oh my gosh! There, there I am. <laughs> um, that's me with my my younger sister, my cousin. My cousin Kwame Dance uh, grew up in Cambridge. Went from pre-K through high school, Cambridge Public Schools. My father's family went from pre-K through high school, Cambridge Public Schools. My aunt um, was one of the first Black tenured teachers at Cambridge Ridge and Latin School, um, and my grandfather you see there with the lighter skin was from Virginia, moved his family here in the 1940s, purchased property in the South End, rented it out to black and Caribbean migrants from roughly 1944 up until the 1980s. And so I grew up around people who were black but who were very steeped in New England, but also steeped in the diaspora. And so I was so foolish that I thought that was like everywhere. Like, so I thought, I thought when I went to college, oh my goodness, this is like a story that everyone would know. Because I grew up, as you guys are saying, hearing these stories. And every Sunday, my grandmother, who lived in Arlington, would have these dinners. And she'd invite all the black people who lived in Cambridge and Boston would come out. And they just talk about their family histories, right? And that was how I first came to hearing these stories. And they were like from Cape Verde, and they were from Barbados, and they were from Jamaica, and they were from Virginia, and they were from, you know, um, Georgia, right? And so I really um, think that Boston... Um, offers us to way look to look at the um, the weirdness of of how we look at and discuss slavery and race in this country, because in Boston we tend to think that it's distant from us, right? And we tend to think that somehow this region of the country is absolved, that this region of the country is somehow um, the apex of anti-slavery liberalism, right? And that when we start to really delve into the stories, we see just much more complicated than we would originally suspect. Thank you so much. Can we show um, the next slide, if possible? Okay, and the one after that. Okay, did you want to say anything about this? Yes, I was just going to say, you know, I, I, the, the course Dr. Field and I teach at Tufts is about kind of the contradictions that I think is inherent in New England and in Boston, and that is inherent in the United States, which is that you have both a place like Massachusetts um, that has, you know, the, um, the uh, vassal mansion, right, that is a place that when I was growing up, Henry Rogers was Longfellow, we went with my school, which is a pretty perfect progressive school at the time and we read his poems in there and we're talking about all these things and yet the vassal family right this is where uh, they were enslaved right and so those two things can exist at the same time and I think in the United States right now we're coming to a point where it's time for us to realize those are not a contradiction there's a reason why slavery and anti-slavery are growing at the same time in the country and in Massachusetts so this is an example of that Great. And there might be one more slide there after that. 
Oh, and then I wanted to, I, I, one of the other things I think that we can point out about Boston and Cambridge in this area is the long presence of African American people and African descended people from the vassals um, to people like Mariah Baldwin. We know that Mariah Baldwin's family was born possibly, we think, um, um, in the Caribbean. So very much tied into this, moves to Cambridge and she becomes a black educator. The Mariah Baldwin School, of course, is named after her, after it was referred to as the Agassiz School. And so really reckoning with the fact that the legacies of enslavement in a place like New England and in Boston and in Cambridge requires us to recognize that people of African descent have a long, 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 long history here, right? And it takes on all different flavors, colors, things. And part of what 10 Million Names does is be able to tap into that with looking at family histories and genealogies. Okay. And now um, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Brown, with a question um, about how you've approached or encountered or made sense of the history of Boston and Cambridge in a global context. Uh, I can also put up your, the image as well. Yeah, I mean, you can wait for that because maybe I want to pick up first on something that Dr. Greenidge was saying, that Kerry was saying, that I, that I find really important, which is that, you know, we think of United States history as being the history of just North America and the North American colonies that became the United States, the 13 colonies that became the United States. Now, partly because I was attracted to the history of slavery, the history of the African diaspora um, by reggae music, which was prominently played by Jamaicans, I was drawn to the history of Jamaica. And as I learned more and more about the history of Jamaica, I learned that Jamaica was, in fact, the most important of the British American colonies. The British didn't have just 13 colonies in the Americas. They had 26 and more. And by far, the most important of those colonies, the richest, the most profitable, the most militarily significant, um, the best politically connected in, the, in Great Britain, were those colonies in the Caribbean, with Jamaica being most prominent among them. So just to kind of give you a data point, on the eve of the American Revolution in 1774 or so, the average worth of a free white person in Jamaica, where 90% of the population was enslaved, was about 57 times the average worth of a free white person in Massachusetts, which happened to be the least profitable British colony in the Americas, which kind of reorients our sense of what was important in British colonial America. And as you look at the map, you can see that the most profitable colonies are always the colonies that exploit enslaved labor most aggressively. When you get down to Jamaica and Barbados, where the vast majority of the population is enslaved, that's where you find the vast majority of British American wealth being created. And so what happened is, as New England developed in the 17th century, it kind of developed as a suburb, as an economic suburb of the heart of the British Empire, which was in the Caribbean. So already we reorient our sense of where New England is in that world by understanding its relationships to the Caribbean. I think that becomes especially important too for us when we begin to think about these genealogical projects. Many of you will know the story of Isaac Royal and the Isaac Royal House, the Isaac Royal family migrating from Antigua in the Caribbean in the wake of a 1736 slave conspiracy to rebel, right? And then of course Isaac Royal's son uh, leaving his property to Harvard University, which gift became the first establishment of the, of the first chair in law at Harvard University, effectively the establishment of Harvard Law School. Harvard was recognizing this for years and years by using the Isaac Royal family crest as the Harvard Law School crest until very recently, right? So there's a connection right there. Even though Antigua never became part of the United States, those enslaved people in Antigua generated the wealth that helped to found Harvard Law School, right? And until very recently also, Harvard Law School had an Isaac Royal chair in its law school, right? Now, we know that Isaac Royal in some ways helped to suppress that slave conspiracy because one of his drivers, a man named Hector, was executed for conspiracy. And Isaac Royal was paid 70 pounds for the state executing his lost property, right? Now, how much that 70 pounds would be worth in today's dollars, I don't know. What we do know is the money for that executed slave went into Isaac Royal's estate, right? And, as money is fungible, helped to found Harvard Law School. The Isaac Royal family still had a chair in their name at Harvard Law School in the 21st century. Hector's family represented nowhere. 
right? That kind of story, I think, really alerts us to the legacies of slavery in our own time and how far they carried forward, how far the power of Isaac Royal's family name carried forward, and how the dispossession of Hector's family ended right there in the 18th century, right? With no legacy. I think we can think again about the Vassal family. A lot of you will know the story of the Royals, but fewer people know the story of the Longfellow House here, which of course, you may know, was George Washington's headquarters early in the American Revolution, the American War for Independence, but had been built in 1759 with profits made from Jamaica plantations. And when I began my research into Tacky's Revolt in 1760 and 61, which was the largest slave revolt in the 18th century British Empire, one of the best sources I found was a letter from a man named Leonard Stedman to William Vossel, who owned the plantation in Jamaica. And can we put up that slide of that letter? Yes, that's it right there. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see those, but those sources are all at the Houghton Library here at Harvard University. And, um, in one of them, you'll see a property list where you'll see Negroes listed alongside other goods purchased for sale and sold. But then you'll see this long letter from Leonard Stedman to William Vossel describing what was, before the American Revolution, the greatest threat to the British Empire in the 18th century to date, right? Which was a threat to the Vassal's property as well. So if I have a minute, can I read a little bit of that letter? So we have Leonard Stedman to William Vassal, St. Elizabeth, Jamaica, 7th June, 1760. And that's folder 84 in the Vassal papers at Houghton Library if we'd like to see it for yourself. And he begins, in the parish of Westmoreland on Whit Sunday night, about nine o'clock, a number of Coromante Negroes to the amount of a hundred rose in rebellion on the estate of Captain Arthur Forrest as the attorney with several others were setting round the table. They were marking how still and quiet everything was. All at once had a musket fired in upon them and the house filled with Negroes. They killed Mr. Smith, the attorney, wounded Captain Hoare very much and killed his nephew. But Captain Richardson, who was present, made his escape and got clear, which gave the general alarm. But before a body could be collected together, their number increased to three or four hundred as a number joined them from different estates and was pursuing on to the forest estate to destroy it and march up to Mr. Crawford's house that joins Jones' estate. And he goes on and on and on as these slave rebels seeking their freedom begin to overrun the parish. Now, the rebellion turns against the enslaved as the British uh, collect reinforcements. And he writes again 10 days later saying, since which they've increased, some say to a thousand, but according to the best account we can learn, there is about 700 out still enslaved rebels out, men, women, and children. Our party has taken and killed about 200, and what they bring in alive, we burn, and some we hang in gibbets. They say the rebels are now drove to their last shift, their ammunition being almost expended, that they have been already obliged to make slugs of dollars and pieces of eight to fire, and provisions so scarce among them when we have found them roast our whites as they kill them, and they in that deplorable condition that we find daily there, women and children hanging to prevent their coming in. So that's the gruesome end to this rebellion in Westmoreland Parish. That is also the Vassal family estate. That is also the Vassal family legacy. Even though that's Jamaica in 1760, not the United States, not Massachusetts, that's our history too. And that, to me, is one of the important things about this project, is it allows us to see connections that we don't normally see when we think of history as being the history of New England or history of being the history of the United States or the history of the Caribbean as being separate from these other national histories. But when we think of, as you said, a global system, right, we can begin to see these connections that have left their legacies in our present. 
Thank you so much. Um, so, so powerful. You know, I think of this um, quote from the writer Amitav Ghosh, who said, writing about families is one way to not write about the nation. Um, because families naturally interrupt, you know, whatever the given categories are we, we think we're after, whether that's nation or race or otherwise. Um, and family history has that power, too, I think, to illuminate in that way. Um, we want to make sure we have lots of time for questions. Um, uh, you know, I had one last question, which I'll throw out there, but I think then we should move on to our, our group questions, which is, um, you know, how do, how do we want to think about the role of descendant communities like um, like uh, like Dennis Lloyd's and Egypt Lloyd's um, and the coalition you've been building and others? You know, there, there's as we build this broader Ten Million Names project, um, one of the most exciting things is to is to see up close the work of descendant communities across the country, uh, Africatown and Mobile and Mitchellville and um, the, the Southeast, um, the um, you know, freedom colonies and descendants in Texas. Um, there's just such a rich tapestry of, you know, intergenerational long standing descendant work and thinking about how we can li better link up. You know, I know, and as we all know, you know, many of us know from family reunions, right, that we know that's out there, but it very often happens kind of at a uh, parallel to what history supposedly is doing. Thank you very much, Kendra. I'm glad you brought that up because one of the reasons uh, the motivations behind us forming the Slave Legacy History Coalition was the understanding that we as a family uh, were in a very unique position to uh, not only know where our ancestors had come from um, outside of Africa, how they had, had arrived from Jamaica and Antigua uh, via the vassals and the royals uh, to Massachusetts. But not only that, we learned where they lived at and where they worked at, in this case the vassal uh, estate. And where, in fact, they died. And our great ancestor is buried, you know, five doors down and under the undercroft at Christ Church. So where, we, where my ancestors came from, how they got here, um, where they worked, and where they're buried, that's a unique story in uh, which you, you know, I'm sure will attest to, of the number of uh, enslaved African Americans in this country the millions that have, were enslaved, to be able to have that understanding from where to where to presently we're here right now. And I will say, under the direction of the Longfellow host, Chris Began and his staff, Emily Levine, uh, we have learned a lot more about our family, too. So, so thank you. So I think now we can, we can take questions. Does anybody have questions? Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm wondering if the project, um, it sounds almost like a certain aspect was started by a Harvard student trying to connect with the Lloyd family. Is the project going to like actively take on what I call reverse genealogy, where you take this historic person that you, you can know a lot about, you don't know who they connect to? but bring them forward to find descendants. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so to clarify, um, we have we have <laughs> kind of two projects represented here. So 10 million names, and then the story about the Harvard undergrad is specifically um, the Slave Legacy History Coalition and, um, project. So I'll speak on behalf of 10 million names. Um, Traditionally, genealogists start with a present-day descendant, or descendant starts, and works their way backward. Um, one of the, the ideas in this, a, a key idea, which comes out of the Georgetown Memory Project, um, which was in some ways kind of the, the first of, of these endeavors within uh, 10 million names in terms of the data sets, was to start with at the, what they call the ancestor level and work their way forward. Um, and as I like to joke, you know, that's how historians also work. We start back there 
It's just that many historians just stay back there. <laughs> but among historians who do family history, we work our way forward. And so um, in some ways, we're meeting in the middle between uh, genealogical, uh, more traditional genealogical methods and then historical methods, or kind of, as you put it, reverse genealogy. Anyone else? Um, thank you. That was incredibly informational. I teach seventh and eighth grade social studies, and I think this history is so incredible, but part of the difficulty of it is the primary sources, and I used, I read Tacky's Revolt, used it in my classroom, but um, it can be unapproachable for those younger age groups. Do you have any suggestions other than, you know, going to the royal house and and those kind of incredible trips that are available for younger students who might be interested in getting to know this stuff? Yes, okay. I'm going to give it to Carrie. I will say, though, get your students interviewing their elders. <laughs> Yeah, I would I would say as as Kendra says, have your students interview elders in their family and in, in their communities. I think also approaching it from stories. There's so many fabulous stories that occur that children want to know and that are are fabulous. You know, like and 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 approaching it from the history of communities and people, as opposed to like this is a problem, right? <laughs> or this is a it 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 drives home, um, you can get a lot more out of that than you can out of, um, you know, forcing, you know, a fourth or fifth grader to look at a, you know, dense primary source like we just, we just had up there, you know. You, you, you can really get people to really look at, so, I mean, one of the most valuable um, um, lessons that um, I got was when I did consulting for a school in Boston in around 2014, 2015, and I was teaching, you know, schools teachers who are primarily teaching ASL mostly to Haitian and um, Cape Verdean migrants in public schools and teaching them like, what, well, how do we do social studies? The students seem very like, they don't seem like they're paying attention, all this type of stuff. And it was like, well, have them talk about somebody in their community who they can just talk to, right, as a nine or 10 year old, right? So go out and talk to that person, take notes on that person, and then what can you like, just learn from that person. And these, these students were coming from these rich communities. I mean, they were coming from like Haiti where they had a grandparent or an uncle in the household who had come from Haiti like in the 80s and then went back and then came back, right? That's, fa that's fascinating stuff, right? And the kids were really into it, right? Because they're going in, they're interviewing people. Or the people from Cape Verde, it's like, well, why are you coming to Boston that's cold and like, <laughs> you know, what? Why, would you, why would you come here from Cape Verde, right? right? They were going in, they were interviewing people in their family, and I don't particularly like Boston, but I came here for this reason. Or I came here because we've been coming back and forth to Boston since 1910, so of course we're going to come here to work, and then we're going to go back, right? So I think I think focusing on, very passionate, Kendra and I, I know, and Vince are passionate about kids learning through stories and through interviewing people and through looking at the stories in their own lives. Um, did you teach Tacky's Revolt to, to middle schoolers? I was gonna say, because I didn't write it for them. <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say respect, because that's, I mean, you must be a, a really good teacher if you taught that book to them. Okay, um, so I completely agree with Carrie that like telling stories is a great way for kids to learn, but in my experience, even better is just getting them to ask questions, because most of the questions, or a lot of the questions they have, will have historical answers. How come your Brazilian friends speak Portuguese and your Argentine friends speak Spanish? Now we've got to go back to the 15th century and the way the Catholic Church divided the known world and the explored world, right? Down a vertical axis and they didn't know Brazil would be sticking out the other side. They gave one half to the Spanish, they gave the other half, which they thought was just Africa to the Portuguese, and the Portuguese discovered what became Brazil and, and Brazilians speak Portuguese. I mean, this kind of thing, like there, all of these questions they'll have that'll emerge out of the patterns they see in their daily lives. They will have historical answers that take them back hundreds of years. And I think, you know, as I said, in my case, you know, when somebody asks you a question that you want the answer to, you'll seek the answer to it. You'll find the sources you need. You'll, you'll begin to seek out the explanations. Um, and then they're, they're going to be doing your job as a teacher for you. I'm just going to add one, um, one other thing. 
um, this, this is my little soapbox, but Carrie and I uh, are often on it together, which is, um, you know, we often talk about, we talk about people and places, right? So when we did the African American trail map, there was like a, we, we, we started doing bus tours with, with um, some teachers in Somerville and Medford. And, the, and one of the ideas was um, this should be a living, breathing thing. You can go to the website, you can suggest a new site. What happened across the street from my school? What happened across the street from where I live? Um, let me go back and reconsider construct that history related to African American history, the history of the diaspora. Um, so, so real tangible ways, either through stories about places and stories about people that we find um, can be the most powerful and also cut through, you know, jargon and, um, you know, conventional or tired debate. Um, and one of the other things that we often emphasize is you know, the importance of not conflating kind of social justice education, right, and, and sometimes anti-racist education with the histories of, you know, peoplehood and heritage, right? And oftentimes, um, I'm speaking more as a parent than I am as an educator now, um, you encounter that there might be a curriculum that's built for social justice, right, for, for white students, uh, especially to understand privilege or power or allyship or whatever the word is. Um, but in fact, you know, the, the kids of color in the room, especially African Americans in the room, often will, um, you know, their parents may or may not want their first introduction to ideas about race to be through that lens, right, racism, but instead, who are your people, which is a question everyone has, right? So I often go into my kid's classroom and do workshops on family history, right? We all have people. Who are those people, right? Um, whether that's, you know, um, biological family or chosen family, who are our people? Where do they come from? What are their histories? Um, yeah. So, so that is really a universal piece that I think can be really powerful and, um, and that I think it's important to kind of preserve separate and apart from our ideas about justice. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have first a comment on that and then a question. A comment is, um, uh, in my experience working with the Harvard and Legacy of Slavery Initiative, we've begun to lead what we're calling Harvard and Landscape of Slavery tours. That expression, landscape of slavery, is from Sven Beckert, another Harvard scholar. But I just want to echo what you're saying about the power of embodying this history and bringing it to the land and actually going to these sites if you have the opportunity to do that and being there to honor um, the land, um, the ancestors, the enslaved, um, and to feel it in your own body because ultimately this is a, a form of what Resma Menachem would call a legacy of white body supremacy, not just white supremacy. And so my question is in your work with the 10 Million Names Project, um, to what extent are you engaging with descendants of enslavers? I'm guessing there are some, if not many, um, descendants of enslavers of the um, enslaved. And I'm just curious how those, how that outreach is going or whether you have capacity to begin to um, uh, hold relationships um, that I could imagine being quite complex. Yes, well, since you mentioned capacity, I will say that there's active recruitment of volunteers. So if anyone's interested in getting involved, um, there are many ways to do that. Um, there have been, and I don't know, Joyce, if you feel differently about this, but in my anecdotal experience, there have been just as many um, descendants of enslavers as there have enslaved who have reached out um, in the last, you know, whatever it's been, uh, seven months. And... Um, and yeah, I think there there is there is existing capacity for that. Um, you know, people have documents; they sometimes have time, and they're willing to um, use that time to um, contribute to the project. And I think that's generally been a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, my daughters and I, my wife. We we had the opportunity to meet um, Julia Royald. Uh, who uh, enslaved our family. And we had a wonderful uh, a reconciliation at Harvard uh, Memorial Chapel Church. And um, since that time, we've developed a very strong relationship. Um, and 
you know, it, it, the experience that Julia brought to us in terms of her uh, understanding of what her ancestors had done. And we had the opportunity to walk through Harvard Law School and look at paintings and look at some documents uh, that uh, were um, uh, written by, actually, the uh, will of her uh, grandfather, who had, great-great-grandfather, who had bequeathed uh, my grandmother, uh, who they owned, uh, to uh, someone else. Uh, and so it was very, very enlightening. And uh, we were, have been able to connect not only, like I said, our ancestral uh, being here in the, in the States, United States, but also our connection to the royal family, which has been very rewarding in terms of our, our knowledge. Mm I'm not quite sure what I should say, but <laughs> oh, yes, in a minute. Uh, uh, well, are there any questions? First of all, as, as Joyce, oh, yeah, Emily has one. Um, I'm just just wondering if it's a question, an invitation. I know this is a, a relatively young project, um, but sounds like it's building on a lot of really important existing connections um, and existing work that's been going on. Um, and I wonder if there are any particular stories of connection um, that have been made so far in terms of family stories, family knowledge, genealogy, um, and some of the more archival research that's been done. Is there anything that sort of stands out as particularly resonant or that's stuck with you so far as part of this project? Um, uh, sure. So a few of those slides we skipped over quickly. I can, I can share a little more about what the kind of big projects, the umbrellas are that have been emerging. Um, one is um, kind of sites of labor. It's called Making America, but it's broader than that. Um, and that those are essentially plant, you know, plantation ledgers, um, any records related to the places where um, people were enslaved um, and laboring. Um, then there's a, a project, um, Flagstaff project, that's essentially uh, freedom seekers, mariners, um, sailors, um, uh, fugitive slaves, people who whose records records we or whose names we have access to because um, of a newspaper ad or a ship manifest, right? Um, then there is a category um, and uh, military records, um, of course, in terms of pre-1870, it's one of the richest sources we have in terms of the Revolutionary War onward through the Civil War. Um, and then there is um, a really one, the one that's that I talk about the most is called Remembering Slavery, and this is includes not only the WPA narratives conducted in the 1930s of uh, interviews with formerly enslaved individuals, but also interviews that were conducted prior to that um, African-American students at Hampton and Fisk University who interviewed grandparents and others um, at least 10 years prior to the WPAs. Um, so we have a, a rich set of uh, collections there, which aren't your traditional genealogical resources, but really do map nicely onto those more traditional ones. Um, so that's some of the um, most exciting stuff for me. And I think, um, again, the, out, the, the the messages that we've received in those early days, the number of people who have come forward and said, and thanks to Joyce, we're able to make good on this. Um, let's partner, let's figure out how to make my data set look like your data set or vice versa, right? How to make them integrate more easily um, so that we can, um, you know, when you go to the 10 million names site, if you click on a record, it might redirect you to a much smaller organization in Louisiana, which um, has been doing this work for, for many 
many, many years. So, so the idea is that that 10 million names data set will essentially um, lead you to a be a portal through which you can get to many other organizations um, and that there can be some reciprocity in terms of those relationships that are being built. Thank you very much. Um, it's been certainly an honor to be here this evening uh, and to with all of you and to you know hear about the 10 million uh, names project and also Joyce. Joyce neglected to say that we grew up in the same neighborhood, so <laughs> we've, been, we've known each other for a long time. But um, Egypt, wait, my daughter, can you come up, yeah, please? As I mentioned, uh, <laughs> as I mentioned. Uh, Dr. Kendra Greenwich was our first speaker. Come over this way. And, and was our first speaker at the Slave Legacy Easter Coalition. And her. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she spoke on uh, William Monroe Trotter. And as you may or may not know, William Monroe Trotter uh, was the publisher of the. Uh, Boston Guardian, and so we had the, I happen to have the original copy of this particular publication, and um, in the corner over here is the obituary of my great-great-grandmother, yes. you know, and uh, so it gives uh, some lineage here, which, you know, I certainly will, uh, about that. Yes. yes, so um, we wanted to, and I say we, the Slave Legacy History Coalition, wanted to thank uh, Dr. K uh, Kerry Greenwich you know, for, <laughs> for being the first speaker at the Slave Legacy History Coalition, which was on January 21st, 2021. And so, uh, and today being February, excuse me, uh, January 12th, 2021, and today being February uh, 12th, yeah, 2024. So we're very honored, very pleased, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. For this is so beautiful. Thank you so much. I didn't expect it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just say, you guys are doing wonderful work. Like, you know, couldn't be a historian without stuff like this. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you and to. Yes. Anyway, thank you. My, my nerd heart is like. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up, unless there's any closing announcements. Um, you can go to the website um, for Slave Legacy History Coalition, which is the website for 10 million names, to learn more about both of these projects. Um, and if you're interested, again, in getting involved, in um, volunteering or learning more just in general, that you can also learn more, you know, connect up to, to, to get some support in your own family history research. Um, that's very much possible through the project. Um, thank you all for being with us. Thank you.